let's discuss the last point I want to bring out from the server call log analysis. Just real quick first though, what do the ACK and the BY have in common? The ACK and the BY are both subsequent requests in that they both follow after the initial invite. Now I asked you earlier to look in the log to see who ended the call. Surprisingly perhaps the BY didn't seem to be in the server call log. In fact neither did the ACK. For some reason it seems that none of the subsequent requests are there in the server log. Why is this? Are we saying that the server didn't get any subsequent requests? Well, think back for a moment. What is the purpose of this server? Why have we used it? What service has it provided for us? We use the server to perform a location service for us to help us make that call using a public address rather than an IP address. Well, as far as SIP is concerned, the server has fulfilled this role. It's done its job in resolving the addresses and proxying downstream to the endpoint. Is there anything else that it should be doing for us regarding the location process? No. The location is complete. The server has done its job. Both parties now have each other's contact address and from here on can interact directly between themselves with no need for many help from the server. Remember how root sets work and how they're used for the routing of subsequent requests like the ACK and the BY? Well let's review the use of those root sets when there's a proxy sitting in the middle. The caller sends out his invite including in it his contact address, that's the address to which subsequent requests should be routed back to him. The proxy then receives the request and perhaps after a lookup proxies it downstream to the user agent server. Just like we talked about before, the downstream user agent then allocates some memory space, a root set, specifically for remembering the addresses for routing subsequent requests during this call, and stores in it the contact address of the caller. Then the callee includes his own contact address in the final response before sending it upstream to the server, routing the response to the address in the via header. The server proxies the response upstream and on receiving it the user agent client creates his own memory space, his own root set and stores in it the contact address of the callee just in case he needs to send any subsequent requests during this call. Just in case? What are we talking about? Of course he's going to send a subsequent request. In fact he's going to send one right now. It's the ACK. Knowing that the root set is for storing contact addresses of the other guy, the user agent client takes the address from his root set and copies it into the request URI of the ACK before sending the ACK downstream, direct to the user agent server. It's almost as if the server isn't needed anymore. Well, actually that's exactly what it is. The server has performed its location task already. There's nothing more we need it to do now. The ACK goes direct, confirming as usual the reliable delivery of the final response to the invite and triggering, of course, the exchange of media packets. Likewise, when either of the parties wants to send a buy or any other subsequent request, it grabs the address from the root set and puts it in the request URI before sending the request out over the network. So, what do you think? Do you like it? Is this direct routing of subsequent requests a good thing? Do you like the fact that after setting up the call, the server doesn't get any subsequent requests? I guess the answer depends on who you are and what you want. For some people, the mechanism works just fine. If all you want is a basic call, then there's no problem with subsequent requests going direct. But what if you've got a different idea, a different set of needs? What if you're a telecom service provider and you quite like the idea of charging for your calls for things like per second billing and itemized calling? If they don't get the buy at the end of the call, how can they work out how much to charge? Then there's people like us at Avaya. We're in the business of providing intelligent communications, clever and convenient communication services. If our SIP servers don't get to see subsequent requests, then how can we be involved in manipulating and managing calls in clever ways that add value for our customers? That's just it. We can't. I'd love to have been there at that first meeting between the SIP people and the telecoms people, especially at the moment when the SIP people introduced the fact that pure default SIP doesn't give the server any subsequent requests. I wonder, I wonder how long it took before the telecoms guys were kind of showing the SIP people the door, irritated at how their time had been wasted. Imagine the carriers not having control of the call beyond call setup. I can just imagine too the SIP people saying things like, don't worry, just change and adapt. Change the way you do business. 
How about monthly billing? As the door closes behind them. I imagine the sit people went away and had a jolly good think about how they could provide a way of routing subsequent requests through the servers. If you were with the SIP guys back then, do you think you could have come up with any ideas about how to use what SIP has already for the routing of subsequent requests through servers? To enable servers to stay in the signaling path, the SIP people came up with an idea that uses root sets, we know about them already, and two SIP headers, one new one, the record root header, and one we've met briefly before, the root header. Here's how it works. Imagine a scenario in which there are two servers between caller and callee. The caller sends out his invite, as usual addressed to the callee and including his own address in the via header and the contact header. Proxy1 is in loose routing mode, meaning he wants to be kept in the signaling path. He wants to receive subsequent requests. So before proxying the request downstream, as well as adding his via address for responses, he goes and adds that new header I told you about a moment ago, the record root header, and populates it with his own IP address. This is the server's way of telling both user agents they must send all subsequent requests to him so he can keep control of what's going on. It's almost as if he stands boldly, chest puffed out and says, hey, you guys, I'm the boss round here. You make sure you send me those subsequent requests or you're in big trouble. The same thing happens at server 2. Record route is switched on, meaning that server 2 also wants to stay in the signaling path and receive subsequent requests. Hey, you guys, he shouts, make sure you send me your subsequent requests. I'm the boss, OK? And to make sure they get the message, he too copies his own IP address into another record route header and this time adds it to the top of what now becomes a record root list. Notice how potentially we have a growing list of record root headers, similar in a way I suppose to via headers and how they get added to a list. The big difference though is that the via header must be added to every outgoing request, for routing responses of course, whilst the record root header is optional. A server only adds his address in a record root header if he wants to be kept in the signaling path. Now, when the request arrives at the endpoint user agent, normally, besides returning a 100 trying, what would he do at that point? When the request arrives at the endpoint user agent, normally he'd copy the caller's contact address into his root set. But this time, when he sees that there's also record root headers, he copies those as well. All the record root addresses of any servers and the contact address of the caller. Can you see how things are shaping up here for keeping the servers in the signaling path? Can you see where it's going? Now when constructing the final response, the downstream user agent copies in all the record root addresses together with his own contact address and sends that response upstream. Note how Although the via headers are stripped off on the way upstream, the record root list remains intact. It's almost as if the final response is acting as a vehicle to carry the complete list back upstream to the caller. Record root headers do not get stripped off on the way back upstream. When this final response arrives upstream, what do you suggest the user agent client will do? I'm hoping you'll realise that the user agent client will copy all the record root addresses into its root set, together with the callee's contact address. You might even have realised that the order of the record root addresses is also reversed as he copies. So now the root sets are populated with these addresses, how are they actually going to be used by the clients to route subsequent requests back to the servers to ensure that the servers remain in the signaling path? Well, here's what they do. The user agent takes the bottom address from its root set and copies it into the request URI of the outgoing subsequent request, but it does not route the request to that address. It then takes the other addresses stored in its root set and copies them not into record root headers,
but into root headers. In fact, it copies the whole root header list. Now here's a really important new rule that we must always remember. If a root header exists, the topmost root address takes priority over the request URI. So here we have an invite with a request URI and a root header. Simply because the root header exists, the message is routed to the address in that root header and not to the address in the request URI. Even though the request URI points directly at the callee, because a root header exists, the request URI is ignored for now and the request is sent to the address in the topmost root header. In other words, to proxy1. When proxy1 receives it, he gets all excited that the user agents have followed his decree and have routed subsequent requests to him because now he has an opportunity to look at the request and maybe do something clever. Start the billing timer, update someone's present status or whatever he wants to do. After he's done, he'll send the request downstream. But notice how he first strips off his own address from the root header list. It's served its purpose now, so it can be taken away. When Proxy2 receives the request, he feels pretty much the same way that Proxy1 felt. Glad that he's receiving subsequent requests so that he too can now have a chance to perform some processing before forwarding the request on downstream. Notice how Proxy2 also stripped off the root header that contained his own address, meaning that with no remaining root headers left, the request URI once again takes precedence and the request is routed directly to the caller. Interesting. So we know the new rule then. If a root header exists within a request, the request is routed to the address in the topmost root header, not to the address in the normal request URI. Now we've seen from this scenario that a record root header always generates a root header in subsequent requests. In other words, whenever a server adds a record root header, a root header will always be included in the subsequent request. But is the reverse of this true? Should we always expect to see a record root header preceding a root header? Has there been any occasion so far when we've seen a root header on its own without any preceding record root? In fact, you've already seen at least two occasions where root headers have been used without any preceding record root. Do you remember when? We saw our first root header in the register request we sent to the server. Remember the rule? Well, the user agent knows that rule too, and in fact exploits it for its own purposes. If a root header exists, the request must be routed to the address in the topmost root header, not to the address in the request URI. Here the user agent has intentionally added the root header and populated it with the address of the outbound proxy, the reason being to dynamically force a route straight to the default outbound proxy, regardless of the address in the request URI. The same was true for the invite. It too used the root header to force a route to the default outbound proxy to get some help with location. After all, the request URI already contained the public address of the callee, so some other way was needed to route the request to the location server. So we've seen how a record root header always results in a root header in subsequent requests. But please, please, please do not think this relationship is true the other way around, that a root header can only be used in subsequent requests following an earlier record root header. This is certainly not true. Root headers can be used in their own right, in initial requests, like this register and this invite request, to dynamically force a route for the request anywhere a SIP device wants to send it, regardless of the intended address found in the request URI. We'll look at the standalone root header again in the last lesson, particularly at how it gives great power to servers within the core of the network to route requests to other servers, both generic servers like the SIP application server, or specific products or platforms like Avaya's communication manager. Right, one more thing about the record root process before we move on to another topic. So what we're saying here is that by simply adding a record root header, servers can guarantee they'll be kept in the signaling path, guarantee they'll have an opportunity to receive and therefore process subsequent requests, right? 
wrong. Now think back to that imaginary meeting we discussed earlier. You know the one between the carriers and the SIP people. Now imagine the next phase when the SIP people come back and present the new mechanism for including servers in the signaling path. Now how do you think this idea was received by the carriers? Well, perhaps to put the question in a more helpful context, how about this? Who do the carriers actually trust? Now some would say the carriers trust no one, particularly the endpoint user. Now the record route mechanism relies very much on endpoints being trustworthy and actually obeying the new rules. Firstly to copy the addresses from the record route headers into the root set and then to copy the addresses from the root set into the root headers of subsequent requests and then to actually send the request to the topmost address in the root header list. Now don't get me wrong, it works just fine when you have a trusted network and trustworthy agents, as is most often the case. And just to be sure, service providers often have trusted gatekeepers representing the endpoints at the edge of their trusted networks, in which case there'd be no problem. But just be aware of the possibility of abuse if you have a non-trusted environment. So what if you're not in a trusted environment? Is there a more secure solution? Well, there's an application model in which the server actually becomes the endpoint rather than a midway proxy. And it's used almost all the time. It's a great idea that gives the server complete control regardless of the trustworthiness of the clients. It's called the B2B UA or back-to-back -back user agent. We'll discuss it in depth in the next lesson. To get started on the next topic, I'd like you to take a look at this set of statements that describe a typical call setup. The only thing is the sequence of steps has been jumbled up. The steps described are not in the correct order. So take a moment to read through these steps now and either in your mind or using paper and pencil, note the correct sequence so that they make sense. Go ahead and press play when you're ready. Now here's how I think they should be sequenced. So take a look and see how our sequences compare. Once again, press play when you're ready. Now what's interesting to me here is not so much the logical sequencing, but the fact that through SIP registration and through location, it doesn't really matter where we're physically located. So long as we can get an accessible IP address, no matter where we're located in the world, we can receive calls addressed to our public SIP address. Now running through the sequence together, we see that John is usually based out of his North American office, but today he's on business across the other side of the world. Once there he plugs in and gets an accessible IP address and straight away registers with his regular SIP registrar in North America. Then when Sue calls his public address, her outbound proxy uses DNS to resolve the domain name in John's public SIP address, just as usual, and sends the request to John's proxy, which in turn performs that location task and proxies the request on downstream to John's current contact address in Africa. Fantastic! We're not tied to a one-to-one, -one, person to telephone relationship. SIP inherently provides user mobility. We can take our calls anywhere that we can get an accessible IP address. Whilst on the topic of inherent benefits of SIP registration, take a look at this SIP register request. What do you notice is different about this particular registration? You might have noticed that this registration has multiple contact addresses. One public SIP address in the two header, but multiple contact addresses. Hmm. So, first of all, why might someone like John here register a number of contact addresses against his single public SIP address? And secondly, what do you imagine would be the result of an incoming invite addressed to his single public SIP address? Well, let's try it and find out. I've got three user agents here each registered against John's single public SIP address, but as you notice, they each have their own separate contact address. 
I'll just check the database real quick and run a quick query and we do see for sure that we have against John's single public SIP address those three separate contact addresses. So I'll quickly bring in another user agent now from which we can make a call to John's public SIP address. Here we go, watch what happens. As you can see, the call has been routed to not just one address, but to the three separate contact addresses registered against John's single public SIP address. So we saw that when the request arrived at the server and the location service returned multiple contact addresses, the request was proxied simultaneously to all of those addresses. This in SIP terms is known as forking. In this case, parallel forking, designed as a mechanism to enable us to take our calls on any one of a number of endpoint devices. We can register devices in all the locations we think we might be in. Then when a call comes in for us, all of our devices will ring and we can take the call from the nearest phone. So here we are again with our parallel forking scenario. The phones are still ringing. Now watch what happens if I click accept on either of these three endpoints. Here I'll take the call here. You can see that the call has been connected by the agent on which I accepted the call and the caller, but the other two agents have stopped ringing. When the server saw the 200 OK coming back from this guy, he then sent out a cancel request to all the outstanding agents, cancelling the call and stopping the phone from ringing. Another type of forking is sequential forking. The process is pretty much the same as with parallel forking, except the devices are tried in sequence rather than in parallel. The first phone is tried and if the call is rejected or if no one answers, the second is then tried and the third and so on, one after the other. I'm just gonna reconfigure the server to enable sequential forking. So when I click dial now, we see that first of all, the call comes through to one agent. If I hang up, then the server will detect the error response coming back and rather than send it upstream to the caller, will then take the second address in the list and proxy it on downstream to that second address. Here we go, I'll hang up. We can see that straight away the server has now sent the request onto the second destination and if I hang up, onto the third and so on. I'll take the call here and we have a connection between the caller and the third contact address of the callee. So we've seen how one public SIP address can be mapped to multiple contact addresses, a one-to-many relationship. Now there's nothing to stop us from going one step further and having multiple public addresses mapped to multiple contact addresses, a many-to-many -many relationship. It might be that John, in his spare time, has another occupation. Now so long as the service provider allows it and the necessary DNS registrations have taken place, there's nothing to stop an invite to a second public address being sent to the same proxy and being proxied to the same registered endpoints. Interesting. There we go. User mobility and forking two inherent services or features of SIP. We've talked about the registrar server, the location server, the proxy server, and even the user agent server. Let's talk about another standard SIP server or service now, the redirection service. So to put things in context, let's discuss first why might someone actually need redirection? Now how about the scenario where someone moves from one service provider to another? Take Laurie at Ubiquity.net for example. Belonging originally to the Ubiquity.net domain, she used to register with the Ubiquity.net server, but for some reason makes a change to avaya.com. Now her public address changes to reflect the new domain name and from here on she registers with the avaya.com server rather than the ubiquity.net server. However, it may well be that she doesn't get around to telling all of her friends that she has a new public SIP address. No matter, she says, I'll see if my old network will perform some redirection for me. You see, it may well be that perhaps for, let's say, five bucks a month for six months, the old network are willing to hold Laurie's new public address on their records with the view that when a call comes in addressed to her old address, the server can act as a redirect server and perform some SIP redirection on behalf of Laurie. Now SIP doesn't define how Laurie communicates her desire for such a service to her old provider or even that the provider should make such a, a service available. 
It just talks about behaviours that can be implemented if desired. Now, it may be that if Lorry's old network choose to provide the service, they enable it to be set up through a web page, through a call to a call centre agent, or through some other way. We haven't seen any redirection yet, so let's continue with our scenario, imagining that Laurie has arranged a redirection with her old network. Now, here's John at work, and he wants to make a call to Laurie at Ubiquity, her old SIP address. So he sends an invite to his own outbound proxy, which in turn queries DNS for the address of the Ubiquity server, and proxies the request downstream to the Ubiquity server. All standard SIP so far, no redirection at all just yet. Now the Ubiquity server, on receipt of the request, queries its registry and finds from its records that the resolved contact address is a public address belonging to a different network, the avaya.com network. It also notices that a redirection arrangement has been made, so immediately gets to work on performing the redirection. Actually, it's quite simple. All the server does is create a SIP response, a 300 type redirection response, and populates its contact header with the forwarding address retrieved from the registry before sending the response back upstream. It's almost as if he's saying, I'm happy to help with providing some location information, but I don't want to get involved in the call setup. I don't want to be included in the signaling path. I don't want to maintain any state regarding this call. I simply don't want to be involved in anything other than supplying an address. Now the word.com server on receipt of this 300 type redirection response, if recursion is enabled, takes the redirection address from the contact header and inserts it into the request URI of the original invite and proxies that original request once more downstream, this time to the avaya.com server. And that's pretty much it regarding redirection. One device looks up and returns an alternative location and another forwards the request to that location. What happens next in our scenario is just plain old SIP location, just like we've talked about earlier. The avaya.com server queries its registry database and resolves Laurie's public address to her contact address and forwards the request directly to her user agent. As she accepts the request and as the usual subsequent SIP messages are exchanged, an RTP path is established and the communication begins. So, there we go. Any response beginning with a 3 is a redirection response, meaning that the invited party is not available at this location but may be found at the given alternative address. The two main redirection responses are the 301 move permanently and the 302 move temporarily. That's pretty much it then for lesson 4. There's just one more topic I'd like to cover before we summarise the lesson and give you an opportunity to work through some review questions. Let's talk about SIP in the real world. I remember back in the early days of SIP wondering how long it would be before SIP took over the world, before we'd all have SIP phones in our houses instead of regular plain old telephones. Now SIP over the last 10 years has indeed been very widely adopted, but we're not at the point yet where we all have those SIP phones. So how do these two worlds coexist? Is it possible for someone with a SIP phone to communicate with someone using a regular phone, even though they use different protocols, speak different languages? It's as if we have two parties who'd like to chat, but because they don't understand the same language, conversation is difficult and perhaps frustrating. How about we help them out a little by providing a translation service, a device that has knowledge of both languages, and which can translate between them. Fantastic! Communication is possible after all. This is the situation we find ourselves in with SIP. Even though the plain old telephones don't understand SIP messages, there are protocol translation services, or protocol gateways, that can help bridge between these two important worlds. The SIP PSTN gateway acts as a SIP endpoint for the SIP part of the call, and as a PSTN endpoint for the PSTN part of the call. So on receipt of a SIP message, it creates an equivalent SS7 message and populates it with relevant details copied from the upstream SIP request before sending it out downstream to the PSDN device. Clever! Both devices have their own forms of identifiers. The SIP endpoint is identified primarily through its IP address, 
while the regular telephone is identified by its telephone number. The gateway in the middle, well, it has both an IP address and a telephone number. So when the SIP caller wants to call a regular phone, it constructs a normal invite, but populates the username part of the request URI with the telephone number of the other guy before sending the request where? To the IP address of the gateway. The gateway then creates a related IAM request set in the called party ID with the content of the username part of the received invites request URI and setting its own telephone number as the ID in the calling party. Much in the same way as we've seen with SIP, it responds with a message to let the upstream party know that the phone is ringing. In this case, an ACM message, which in turn is translated by the gateway into a 180 ringing upstream. The translation continues with an ANM converted to a 200 OK, and because the ACK is only to indicate reliable delivery in the unreliable word of UDP, and because the regular telephone network is inherently reliable, there's no need for any ACK equivalent on the downstream side. Gateways also usually translate between the media packets that have been encoded, perhaps using different codecs. So I've got two phones on my desk here. This one here is a SIP phone, an IP phone, and this one here is a regular plain old telephone. So here we go, I'm going to dial my own number and press dial and with a bit of luck any moment now my other phone here should start ringing. There it is in fact. Okay, so let me take the call. Hello, this is Dave here speaking from his PSTN phone through to his IP phone. Fantastic. Let's talk for a moment about two phrases we often hear about in the SIP world, that of least cost routing and the SIP trunk. Least cost routing is all about finding a connection between two endpoints that has the least cost. It's not something unique to SIP, but to telecoms generally. Now imagine a scenario in which we have a guy who wants to make a call to his buddy on the other side of the world. Now, as you know, there are plenty of telecom service providers throughout the world that have a whole host of trunk lines that could be used in connecting this call. The call could be connected through this connection, or perhaps this connection, or this one. The only thing is, there's no fixed price for use of lines. Different providers have different costs for their lines. Some are relatively cheap, whilst others have much bigger costs. The other factor is that prices may change at different times of the day. Perhaps at night, for example, when things are less busy locally, the lines may cost less to use. Least cost routing means finding the cheapest connection. If you have a device, or even better, a series of devices that has knowledge of network costs and can make decisions about which trunks to use, then costs can be kept to a minimum. There are some companies that even make their money by bulk renting network time and reselling it. So using these low cost lines can save an awful lot of money. So that's least cost routing from the perspective of PSDN trunks. But what about these things called SIP trunks? Let's deal with the SIP trunk. Just as there are many telco service providers throughout the world, there are of course also many IP service providers who each have their own sets of high capacity IP lines dedicated to carrying IP packets. In fact, these IP lines are not just owned by the service providers. There are plenty of enterprise type organizations that have dedicated IP lines of their own. Now, if this call was being made with SIP phones and we could organize a connection from phone to phone completely over that IP connection, then we wouldn't have to use the expensive PSTN at all. Fantastic. Often a significant cost reduction. So in the case where a high capacity IP line is being used for SIP communications, this line is known as a SIP trunk. We looked earlier at how any response 400 or above is an error response that indicates failure of some kind. But we didn't look in detail at the 500 or the 600. So let's take a look at the 500 now in the context of the gateway. Now imagine a scenario in which a gateway has helped set up a call when all of a sudden it receives an IMBAD message. Now I'm not sure how much you know about SS7 signaling, but I'm pretty sure you won't have ever seen an IMBAD message before. 
mostly because I've just made it up. I made it up to illustrate the predicament the gateway would be in if something happened on the PSTN side that it wasn't expecting. What should it do on this kind of occasion? Well, SIP says that it should create and send upstream a 500 response to report back to the SIP caller there's been a problem with the gateway service. In this case, a 502 response reporting that it received a message it didn't know how to translate. Now, generally, the use of the 500 is to report that there's some kind of problem with the server or the service itself. There's a whole bunch of them described by the RFC, but the key thing to remember is that if it begins with a 5, the request has failed because of a problem with an intermediary server, not because of a problem relating to the end point. Whilst we're talking about responses, let's deal with the last family, the 600 family. A 600 response simply means that the request is definitely not going to be successful. No matter what variations the caller tries, it's a no-go. And to illustrate what I mean by a no-go, the 603 decline, it's a way of rejecting the invite without feeling the need to be polite, without hiding the rejection behind that 486 that we've used previously. Another one, the 604 does not exist anywhere, something that's returned after a SIP device knows for sure that the address does not exist. Cool, so now we've formally been introduced to all of the response families. Remember, the key thing is to know the family name and the family characteristics. Gosh, we've covered a lot in this lesson, so much so that we had to do it in two parts. We talked about SIP addresses and registration and how when we provide our public address and our private address, the registrar stores those details in the registry. Do you remember the letter to the server analogy? Now with both addresses stored in the registry, calls can then be made using the more meaningful public SIP addresses instead of the IP address, courtesy of our old friend, the location service, the service that queries the registry for the contact addresses associated with a public address before proxying the request downstream to the endpoint. Don't forget how a server will query DNS if the domain name in the request is not one for which it has responsibility. We spent some time looking at the routing of responses and how each SIP node adds its own address in a via header before sending a request downstream. Now remember how the guys downstream send their response to the topmost item in the via list. Although the via list records a route over which the request has travelled, its prime purpose is to provide a routing path for the responses to go back upstream. We looked in detail at the routing of subsequent requests. We reminded ourselves how subsequent requests are routed according to the addresses stored in the endpoint route sets. Previously, just each other's contact addresses. Now, some of us might have been surprised to find that, unless only further steps were taken, in pure SIP, subsequent requests went direct between the endpoint agents. We went on to look at how servers can add a record route header that results in, if everyone's playing by the rules, the server addresses also being stored in the endpoint's root sets and subsequent requests therefore being routed back through the servers, courtesy of the root header. It's easy to mix up those root sets, root headers, and record root headers, but I hope we got the point. We touched on user mobility, emphasizing the point that we can receive calls anywhere, so long as we can first get an accessible IP address and register it with our normal registrar. Then we looked at how SIP provides a mechanism for a request to be routed to multiple destinations so that a call could be taken from one of a number of locations. We looked at forking. Then we spent some time on the redirection service and saw how a SIP device can choose to return location information to the caller rather than getting involved in the call setup. We looked at how we need SIP PSTN gateways if we want to be able to communicate with regular PSTN phones and how the gateways effectively translate between the two different signaling protocols. We looked at definitions of things like least cost routing, the cheapest connection between endpoints, and what we mean by a SIP trunk, a high capacity IP connection that can carry SIP signaling packets and the media packets without having to use the PSTN at all. Finally, we looked at the last two families of SIP responses, 
the 500 server error, and the 600 global failure. It's been a busy day. Right, just one more lesson ahead of you now. Coming up in lesson five, we'll look at how SIP is open, flexible, and extensible, and how therefore it's ideal for people like us at Avaya and our colleagues and partners in the communications industry for being creative and exciting with our communication services. We'll look at how SIP gives us the tools with which to be innovative and creative. Can't wait.